Matthew 25, and the parable reads, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it proportion, it, what, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver uh, silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used the money. The servant to whom had been entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The, I'm sorry, my page went over. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling, I'm sorry, yeah, you have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I've earned two more. The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you did not plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hallelujah. What a great story, amen. If you will, as you're preparing to take your seats, help me introduce the title for today's message. Everyone say, I'll take it back. I'll take it back. Amen. I'll take it back. This past weekend, uh, the television was on and it happened to be on the show Bruce Almighty. And many of you know I, I love movies. That is one of the, the it's almost like a, a love language at this point, right? Like I just, I totally enjoy them. And I actually really enjoy this particular depiction of God and interplay with humanity. Now, it wasn't a biblical message. It wasn't any of that. But I thought the way in which the story was told was really good. You have an individual going through life feeling as if they're on the losing end of so many things. Job is not going well. They're losing money. Uh, things happen over and over again. We've had mornings like this. The car breaks down. Everything is going wrong. And in a moment of frustration and rage after he's kind of had it over, he's had enough, he reaches out to God, right? If there is a God, and I love this one line that he says, well, smite me, oh mighty smiter, right? 
And that's just, that just embodies how he feels. Surely, God, everything is going wrong. Why don't you just smite me? And then there's this turn of events. All of a sudden now he's, he bumps into God. God definitely doesn't look the way that he probably would have expected, being that he's Morgan Freeman. Um, but even more so because Morgan Freeman is just randomly working in the building. He's mopping the floor. He's changing the lights. And soon... He's given all of God's power to utilize. He takes this and finally he can turn his stars. He transforms the old broken car that he he had. He he goes back to this group of uh, thugs, so to speak, that beat him up in an alley and he gets his revenge on them. I mean, he even draws the moon closer so that he and his girl can have an even better evening. It's a lot of problems that my man is having. Yet all of a sudden, he recognizes that as much as he has all of these powers, there's something that comes along with them. There's this constancy of voices that are starting to run through his head, and he recognizes that with this responsibility, with all of these gifts, now there are so many people who depend on them. And he's been so good at serving himself, he has not done well serving all of those in need. And the rest of the movie kind of goes on this journey of him really figuring out what it means to not just think about self and maybe how challenging it is to be given such amazing gifts. Well, I think this particular passage opens us in the same way. This passage about really three servants and the expectation that the master would have for those to whom are given so much. Jesus has now been walking. We've listened to him talk quite a bit. He's actually in Jerusalem at this point. This is the last official parable that Matthew chronicles. Everything from here will lead to Jesus' passion upon the cross. And in trying to make sure that he gives out his best and most uh, maybe poignant information, he nestles in kind of the three parables, helping us to understand judgment. And he closes it off with this one about three servants. Scripture says that the master is getting ready to go away. He's going on a trip. Doesn't tell us why. Doesn't tell us how long. All we know is he's leaving. But when he leaves, he splits up his resources and hands them out to those who had already been working. One gets five, one gets three, and I'm sorry, two, and the other gets one. Now, it's meant to be very big because this is kind of a a departure from Luke because Luke made it seem like, you know, the amount wasn't as much. But now this has really been extrapolated. Now there are talents. Everybody say talents. Talent is a Greek word for a measure of either amount of money or the weight of gold and or silver. We talked about this last week. In fact, it is thought to be about 6,000 days worth of pay or 20 years worth of wages for an individual. One talent. And this guy is given five. The other one is given two and the other is given one. This is huge. It is meant to show us that there are some amazingly and impressive and precious gifts that the master gives. And we're told this so that we can see how we should respond versus how we should not respond. Scripture says that they're dealt out. They're, they're divvied up according to ability. Now, I want to lift this up because I know me. And I know I have a great way of practicing one of the most unhealthiest things that I think human society can go through. It's called comparison. I'll say that again. 
I have a, a, a real big challenge is I look at my life and I often use the idea of comparison to try to judge where I am. And I get it, right? Most of our life, we deal with so many things such as uh, comparison as it re relates to sports or activities, right? If you're not first, then you have to be something else. Like right? first is relative, relative to everybody else that's in the race. Either you win, but it's relative to the other people that are playing the game. So most of our lives, we see ourselves relative to one another. So we grow up kind of thinking, oh man, I should be measuring myself in comparison to people that are around me. And I know right, right, like this, this kind of makes sense and most of us do this, but as you get older and older, you recognize that there's a deficiency in this way of chronicling how successful any individual could be. If I want to compare my shooting ability to Stephen Curry, I'm going to be terrible. Like, I shouldn't shoot a basketball ever in my life. If I want to compare it to a two-year-old that can barely pick up a ball, I might look absolutely amazing, depending on how I compare. The problem with comparison, then, is it assumes that everybody is given the same thing, that everybody is starting from the same place, and that everybody has equal opportunity. But the truth of the matter is, we all know that ain't true. You go to your job regularly with people that you have to report to that you can easily communicate how you know they should not be in the position that they are in. And you still don't fully understand why you have to communicate to them why you do what you do, and they have no idea how to run anything. But maybe they got started earlier. Maybe a door was provided. Maybe an opportunity given that has allowed them to be in a different position. This, this is challenging. And then, talking, I'm going to talk to the, the, the online community because I know this ain't y'all, right? The other part that comparison really makes it bad about is... Sometimes it makes us feel like we're losing even when we're winning. I've been around a lot of amazing people in my life, and I've done the unhealthy thing by making up these false standards by where I should be at certain levels of my life. And I know nobody else is doing this, so I'm just going to tell my story, right? Like you have these ages, and like by a certain age, I'm supposed to be at a certain place. Like, when I hit this age, I should have accomplished this. And when I hit this age, I was supposed to be there. And when I hit this age, I needed to have accomplished this. And then we begin to, and, and social media makes it even more difficult, because then we look out into the world and we see the individuals that sometimes look like they're hitting those goals, and we aren't hitting those goals, and then we begin to question how it is that we're living or how good our life really is, because we're comparing what we have versus what they have, and I'm telling you, this very story lifts all of this up. It lifts up that the master now has given out resources, has delegated, has uh, proportioned it out to, to the servants, and the scripture says, based on their ability. Now, let me be honest. There are few places, few people, and few systems that I trust to judge ability. I'm going to say that again. There are few places, few people, and few systems that I trust to judge ability. Amen. We've recognized this is challenging uh, in the educational realm. Yeah. We've used standardized testing to try to determine the intelligence of a certain groups of people, how well they're moved, and we recognize that even the testing isn't always done well. Yeah. Sometimes it misses some other ideas, so this is not the best way to figure out if somebody is good. Some of you know you have people in class and it's not the folks that made straight A's that sometimes turn out to be the most successful because it's not just the grade that determines one's ability and the gifting, right? We recognize this. Some of us know the number one draft pick or number two draft pick may not always be the best player that's picked because we don't always have the best way of judging Yet here, 
In this parable, we recognize that the master actually does. In a world where we're used to things being unfair and systems being broken, we have to be cautious of bringing that perspective and expectation to God. Now, we probably should bring it to church. <laughs> we probably should bring it to work. But we got to be cautious of bringing this to God. Because there are times where now I think that we've gone back to God and say, God, why didn't you give me this? God, why didn't you allow me to have that? Why wasn't I crafted that way, I still sit with God and try to figure out why he did not allow me to have a better singing voice. I, man, do you know, do you know what I could do? Do you know how easy it is to preach when you can sing? You ain't even got to say nothing. It just sounds better when you're able to sing it. And uh, God, with, you see, I can't even do it. You just say, man, it just ain't fair. And I know I would have used my abilities for evil. Oh, I would, have sung, I would have sung some things that probably wouldn't have gave God glory. I would have sung myself into some situations that would have got me in trouble. But I would have sung my way there. Yes, Lord, I would have. Right? There's something about God. Why didn't you give me that thing? Why wasn't I afforded that? Why? Were they given it? Yes. Says that the master looks out at the abilities, measures it out, evaluates, determines what is best for each. Yes. The scripture says then this is given and the master goes away. Master literally doesn't tell the servants what to do, but trusts that they will be able to do something. Now, the, the text that we have, the translation says they invest, but that's not really the wording in the, in the Greek, right? The wording in the Greek is they work. They work these talents. This is the same word that we get the word talent from, special gifting or ability. It comes from this Greek word, this idea of some massive amount being given to an individual. So God has given talent to each of us. And he walks away and then says, what will you do with it? Now, the, the one with five goes to work. And let me be very clear. Goes to work needs to be understood. Because often we think of going to work as to be ours. Clarification point. First is, there's a point here in this message that I want all of us to grab. That the talents were given to the servants, and the servants didn't have the talents before they were given it. Therefore, the talent wasn't really the servants in the first place. The talent was given by the master. It is the master's talent that is given to the servant. And if it is the master's talent that's given to the servant, the servant can't walk around even though they have possession of the talent. It is not just their talent. They have possession of the talent, but it's not just for their ownership. It is connected to the one that actually gave the talent. The problem for so many of us is we walk around like we are the givers of the talent. You walk around like you, the one that made sure that you six foot tall and dark and lovely. You the one that gave yourself the voice. You the one that gave yourself the intelligence. You the one that gave yourself the opportunities. Can I tell you, we miss it when we forget we have been given. The talent has been given. And we get a chance to work it. We get a chance to build on it. We get a chance to rightly use it, but the talent has been given. And how might we operate differently if we weren't... If we didn't allow the talent to possess us, but we recognized it was just a possession.
This is important because the servant is still loved by the master whether he has the talent or not. But if the talent possesses the servant, the servant only understands him or herself as representative to the talent. So what happens if the talent is lost? What happens if the talent doesn't grow? What happens then all of a sudden one's self-definition is transformed because it was connected to the talent because they were possessed by the talent as opposed to it being a possession. That you are always more than the talent that you're given. Always more than your abilities, always more than what you could ever create, manufacture, any of that. That's a gift. That's not you. It says, now, they were given this thing, and they begin to go to work. And the work is not just for them. Because the talent isn't just theirs. So let me park here. Because some of us, we have become so good and so proficient in using our talents, but we never use them for kingdom building. I'll say it again. I believe that we have now stolen the talents God has given us and used them for our own good. And if I continue to tell the story, that's exactly the problem that the last servant had. When the other two servants come back to the master after he returns to see what they've done with these amazing talents, they say, look what you have gave. And this is what we were able to do with it. They present it back to the master. This is not even ours. We know it to be yours. The master is so excited that watch what the master does. You can keep it to continue to work. I'll give you more because you've done well with it. Now, the last one comes up and is like, wait a minute. I know that you like to take stuff that ain't yours. We laugh, but watch this. You gave me one talent. You want me to go to work for your talent and then give you everything that I worked for. You gave me talent, but I did the work. And since I did the work, I don't feel like working and giving everything I worked for back to you. Because I'm the one that did the work. Yeah, you gave me the initial investment. Yeah, you got me started. Yeah, you did. But this is my effort. I want my own effort. And you need to go get your own effort. Therefore, I don't want to give you what I'm willing to work for. So I'll just hold your stuff on the side. And give it back to you when you come back. Because if I can't use it for myself, then I don't want to use it at all. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but we got way too many people that are supposed to be part of the kingdom. And all you doing are using your talents for yourself. All you're doing are trying to build up your own rep. All you're doing is trying to build up your own reputation, your own wealth, your own ideas. And that ain't what the talent is for in the first place. He said... I know that you want to harvest what you ain't sowed. I know that you want to reap what you ain't worked. So here's what you gave me. And he says, useless. One without utility. One who does not do what you were intended to do. Give it back. In fact, he doesn't even say give it back. He said, take it from him. And sometimes I think, right, like, so we think, oh, man, if we don't use our gifts and everything for God, that means, like, oh, we're going to lose the gift completely. And then we'll see folks still singing, and they, they ain't bit more using that gift for, for the kingdom at all. Push pin. I'm always amazed when people use their gifts in ways that is nowhere, there's no way that you can rightly say this is for God, and then they receive the award and they be like this, and I first just want to give honor to God, I just want to thank God <laughs> for such an amazing gift, you know. It, it, it's, 
it's really weird. It's like, it's almost like a mass murderer being like, I want to just thank God for this ability to think so well. I was able to outmaneuver the police, you know, multiple times. Uh, I was able to get to a whole bunch of lives and take them because of God's gifting on my life. So I just want to give honor to God for the, being able to use my gift. What? What? Anyway, push pin out. He says, go take it from him. And so we think that that means that the gift is gone. Sometimes that doesn't mean that the gift is gone, because remember, this is a parable. It's not just allegory. It's also meaning. But this could mean that the joy is gone. This could mean that the fulfillment is gone. This could mean that on your long pursuit of all those things to build self, you found out that you actually lost self. And I want to lift this up, right, because I think that there are so many of us out there and we've been running at this race trying to get that thing and we get closer to it and find out we still ain't got that thing. We're burned out. We're angry. We've, we've cut parts of our, our personality or our morals trying to grow this thing. And at the end of the day, we lost it all anyway. He says, I'll take it. And I can't tell you how many individuals I've talked to when we're not rightly using gifts that sit in places of complete unhappiness, completely unfulfilled, because we're not using it right. So, what has God given to you? The parable is meant to suggest that everyone who will hear it should be able to find a space where they say that there's a talent that you're given. And it doesn't matter if your talent is the five or if your talent is the one, how are you using it? And how are you using it to build kingdoms? I say that because working and serving at the church is part of building kingdom. However, it's not the only way Amen. of building kingdom. Right. That you could be building kingdom even outside of the church, but it should be building kingdom. Yeah. And we're talking about the kingdom of God. So I'll ask again, how are you using your gifts, your talents to build kingdom? How are we making sure that the very message of Jesus and the gifting of God moves throughout the world? How are we doing it or how are we using it just to build ourselves? Because if we're not, then we've, we're literally doing what the last servant told God or told the master. This is what we're telling to God. I know that you are harsh. I know that you require to reap of me what you did not earn and work for. So instead of serving and working for you, I'm going to bury your stuff, or at worst, I'm going to steal it and use it for my own good. How are we using these talents? How are we using these giftings to bless the very kingdom of God? Now, pastoral moment, and then I'll, I'll shift. I'm always amazed, right? Like, we'll come to church, and we'll see a thousand things wrong. Things that we could easily fix. And instead of fixing them, either we'll complain that somebody else should go fix it, or we'll come up with all the ideas and don't say a word. Why would you bury that talent? Why would you bury that gift? Why is the, the, the kingdom of God not doing better? And you're investing this, so we're not talking about like, you coming to work at the church. Okay, fine, I'll go work at the No, no, no. Serving at the church. Like, I'll just be honest. I, I don't know what it communicates if we tell our kids we love them and that we value them, especially in the kingdom, 
and nobody ever wants to help children's ministry ever. What does that say? I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it says about the kingdom or, or, or our connection with God when, if the church ever talks about money, we get offended. As if we did all the work to earn all of the resources ourselves and they are our own. And so, if anybody starts to talk about such stuff such as tithing, we get offended. Like if I was to say, okay, I'm about to show the giving records of the church on the screens, like... That would be the quickest way for me to get put out the church. <laughs> It'd be hilarious. It's like, he's done nothing wrong. He hasn't said it. He, he hasn't messed up anything. But if I put member name and number, they'd be like, whoa. And like, no, I'm a tither. It is impossible for you to tell me you're a tither and you gave $500 last year. Come on. Unless you make $5,000. And listen, God is a way maker. You understand me? God can stretch them two fish and five loaves of bread. But if you making it in the bay off of $5,000, man, we got quiet. Okay, so um, <laughs> ooh, it was like cold. <laughs> am, I by, am I in here? I'm Reverend Meeks, am I in here or am I by myself? Um, but the same point is there. And it's intentional. I meant to lift up the tension there. You ought to be uncomfortable there because it's not just me saying it. It is God asking you the question, what are you doing with what I've given you? Amen. Now, you can tell me anything. I don't know. But at the end of the day, when he comes back, at the end of the day, when he shows back up, at the end of the day, when the true master returns, He's not asking you to give an account to the church that you might not be able to, that you might be able to massage and make look good. He's not asking what's on your social media feed and how many likes you got. He's not telling what story were you able to propose to other folks and get them to praise you. God is going to say, wait a minute, that would have been great if I only gave you one talent. But you weren't the one talent individual. I gave you five talents. The fact that you coming back with this little bit means that you didn't work it the way I know that you could have worked it. And so I want to create a group that will meet a God that when he returns, that he won't have to say, let me take it back. But you'll hear the amazing words, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant. Well done. Let's celebrate together. Let's work this more. And just so I'm clear, the reward for being faithful is not just more stuff. Is greater responsibility. Watch this, watch this. And I've never read it this way until this time, and I'll close. He said, take that talent from the one who I was given one to and give it to the one that now has 10. Started at five, now has 10, now has 11. Is given to the one that has 10 because he has the greatest ability to make up what the one didn't do in the first place. Because now he has to fix what the other servant did not do in the first place. The kingdom is like a group of people helping to fix the mistakes of the other. And oftentimes what happens to the amazingly gifted is that you're given more responsibility to help cover where the other ones have messed up. Well. Yes, it seems like all the bad stuff comes to you because God has gifted you to help fix it. All right. Yes, it feels heavy upon your shoulders because God has given you the shoulders that can bear it. And how great it is to know that we can do this so that we don't end up like the one servant given something so amazing, yet all we do is bury it. 
pray with me.